morning, friends. Morning. Welcome, one and all, to the First Congregational Church of Glen Ellen, a forward-thinking church, a second home for those who seek the love of God, the joy of authentic community. It is wonderful to see all of you here this morning, and I welcome all of those joining us online as well. Today uh, is what we call here at FCCGE Education Sunday, when we give our fourth graders their own Bibles and invite our angel choir to sing and celebrate the joys and virtues of learning. Incidentally, we also had a fantastic trivia night fundraiser last night where I learned just how little I really know. <laughs> of course, it is good to be humbled now and again. We have a few noteworthy things happening here at the church this month. Our green team has some activities planned for Earth Day, our Rebuilding Together project, we'll be working to repair homes, and our annual choir cantata, which I do believe will be exceptionally amazing this year, is coming up in just a couple of weeks as well. I encourage you to read your worship bulletin for more details and information about all of the wonderful things happening here at FCCGE. And a quick reminder, if you've signed up, that we will be hosting our Palestine 101 panel and luncheon today after worship. That has been publicized within the broader United Church of Christ conference, so we'll be welcoming some visitors uh, to that as well. But now, friends, let us be in a spirit of joyful prayer and praise as we commence the worship of our God in song. Chatter with the angels, indeed. A little cuteness overload. So as Seth said, so as Seth said, uh, trivia night was a blast. Uh, and uh, I don't want to brag, <laughs> but my team won.
We were called not cheating. <laughs> and despite our trivia win, I've been thinking a lot about how little we know. I mean, who knows the fifth Kardashian sister? Despite the onslaught of information that we consume every day, we don't know what we think we know. In particular, how little we know about each other. I've been thinking about that. We are quick to judge each other based on one or two small encounters when we don't know what the other person has experienced, what they've endured, what is weighing heavily upon them on a particular day. We don't know, we can't know, whether people are carrying around deep grief, or if they live in fear, or if they have experienced hurt or deep trauma. And so, like Job's friends in the Bible, when, when Job loses everything, we say we can be tempted to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. We make inaccurate assumptions about each other. We try to speak for God, and we make things worse. What folly? And so friends, as we stand before God, I guess we're sitting before God. Would you stand up, please? <laughs> Let us confess our folly. God of the universe, God of the whirlwind, we are so quick to judge, so quick to condemn, so quick to think we may be the smartest person in the room, that we have all the answers. Oh God, help us to, in humility, know what little we know, and in our doubt, then give others the benefit of that doubt. Help us to uncover our own biases, our own complicity in the suffering of others and in the structures that create it. Help us to remember that we too have been wrong or wronged. We too have unknowingly hurt others and have been hurt ourselves. We too have been just hanging on and doing the best we can. May we have the same grace for others as you have for us. Oh God, remind us to see others and ourselves as you see them and us with compassion and love and kindness. Forgive us when we do not. As we stand before you now in honesty and truth, O oh God, we lift up in silence those things that weigh heavily upon us. Friends, God's mercy and compassion are deeper than the ocean and more vast than our expanding universe. And yet God can count the hairs on each of our heads. Know, friends, that you are loved and forgiven in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.
I'm a bit embarrassed to say that I've never been a big fan of poetry. Maybe it's because I don't take the time to savor it. Maybe it's because I love character development. You will usually find me exploring the stories of our faith rather than the poetry of our faith. But I've recently found some beautifully illustrated versions of the Psalms for our children and families that'll be available in the library soon. Maybe it's just that I would like pictures with my poetry. I do have several books of prose, however, that speak to my spirit as poetry does for so many. They are by writer and artist Brian Andreas, and his colorful pen and ink drawings are called Story People. As I was reading through one of his books last week, I came across this piece of writing. He wrote, the first rule is never believe the story you tell about you. It is like a cage around a wild thing. Why would you believe that a spirit so large would ever choose to say, who I am is this cage? That struck me in a few ways. Boom, 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 right after the other. Boom, first I thought, wow. That's what we tried to do with God. We tried to define God. We tried to make God in our image. We try to limit who God loves. We cage God when we don't fully use our tremendous imaginations that God gave us. Because if we're made in God's image and God imagined this earth, this solar system, this universe, then we need to flex our imagination muscles when we try to experience God's bountiful love. Boom. My second thought was, I really, really hope that those adults who are mentors and parents and friends of our children and youth strive to tear down those cages that society and media and those with starved imaginations try to force around them. Sometimes these cages are well-meaning to keep them safe, to keep them safe from disappointment and safe from judgment and to keep them safe from fear. But they are cages nonetheless. Boom! I thought how people were trying to constantly cage Jesus. Not in an actual cage, but in a cage of expectations of what a savior should do and be and look like. Even as a boy, Jesus didn't let small imaginations limit him. One of the few stories a young Jesus is told about in the Bible is that on the way home from Jerusalem after Passover, he disappeared for three days while Joseph and Mary searched for him. Now, fourth graders, I don't recommend that you do that. But when Mary and Joseph found him, they found him in the temple, and he was listening, and he was learning, and he was teaching. And when his earthly parents chastised him for worrying them, he couldn't understand because, of course, where else would he be but in God's house? Now, theologians put his age somewhere around 12 years old, which is not much older than our fourth graders. Our third, fourth, and fifth grade class is a class of much thoughtfulness and imagination and questions. This year, we have learned multiple versions of the story of Jesus. We've explored the different gospels because we want to try to understand the people who encountered Jesus, like us, because we want to sink into the stories and the examples that Jesus showed us because we hope to follow in Jesus' way. We laugh a lot in class, and sometimes we ask silly questions, and we all love to call out, hey oh as one of the ways that we might echo Jesus, the human being who lived on earth and had friends and family. Fourth graders, as you receive your Bibles today, May you always ask questions as Jesus did. 
May you hunger for joy and laughter and share that with others. May you continue to come together with each other, with your families and with a faith community because exploring God's love and the way of Jesus are better together. May you feed your God-given imaginations and always continue to find new ways to feel God's presence, new ways to forgive others, and new ways to celebrate that you are a beloved wild thing created by God to love and so much more. At this time, our Youth Education Associate, Kathy Basso, is going to help me present the Bibles to our fourth graders. Fourth graders, if you're ready to receive your Bibles, please say, Ayo. Ayo. Woo. <laughs> Preston Aldrich. George Brooks. John Durham. Evelyn Jane Lechner. Fiona Leslie. Mia Moyer. Luke Phillips. And we have a very special friend in our fourth grade class who happens to live in Pennsylvania. Joel Shorner Johnson is a fellow fourth grader. And Joel, hello. <laughs> Since Joel couldn't be here in person today to receive his Bible, I am going to present it to Kathy Basso on his behalf. J.T. Zulmierski. Now I invite you to join me in raising your arm as we bless our fourth graders, both here and in Pennsylvania. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn towards you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. Congratulations, and we're so glad you're with us, fourth graders. At this time, I'd like to invite the preschoolers first to go to the back of the sanctuary, and there is a young lady holding a big sign. There she is. You can go get great go to grace. And now our kindergarten through fifth graders. We're going to head up to church school.
out of creation. As spring rains nourish the earth, and as the world explodes with abundance, we are reminded of your care for us and for the whole world. You reveal your promise through the flower hiding in the bulb and the butterfly hiding in the chrysalis. Now reveal your new creation within each of us this day. May we have the patience to wait upon your timing to bring it to fruition. God of new life, continue to fill us with Easter hope and inspire us to live our lives in you and through you. Lead us out of our locked rooms of certainty and fear and frustration and into the world that desperately needs to hear your word of hope. Help us to love you and love each other in deep gratitude for the love you first showed us. God of love, we pray for an end to violence and hate to all your people, for those starving and thirsting in Gaza, for all those displaced in war, for those in Ukraine desperately fighting to keep their land, for the recent escalation in the Middle East. God of justice and peace, help our warring world to stop killing. Help us to put down our weapons and pick up instruments of peace. Help us to confront violence wherever we find it and in whatever form it takes, so that we may shine your light into the darkest places. God, open our eyes to the oppression and suffering that is all around us and inspire us to change ourselves and to change the world. For all your beloved children, O oh God, given into your sacred care, we grieve everyone whom we have failed. Lord, have mercy. God of comfort, be with those who are ailing in body, mind, or spirit. Give them rest and hope and healing. Be with those that stand by them in love. God, we ask that you would give them patience and courage and strength. Especially, we lift up this day Jerry Clausen, Lowell Lindstrom, Mecky Durham, Gretchen Rehm, Philip Koenig, Dave Mook Sr., and Susan Ray. May they each, each of them, know of your healing presence and steadfast care. Oh God, comfort the Troyer family in their time of grief over the loss of Christie's sister, Tamara. May they find assurance in your promises of everlasting life. And comfort to the Shelley family on the death of Sue. May they find your peace that passes all understanding. And for Claire Fisher Leopold and her family as they mourn Kate's passing. Oh God, let your light shine upon them even amidst their sadness. On this anniversary of the founding of our church, we give thanks for its ongoing witness to our community and for being a second home for so many of us. We give thanks for all who have been involved in working with our Sunday school and for all who received their Bibles today. May their minds and hearts be open to you as they read them. We give thanks for our awesome angel choir and for Sherry and Laura who led it and for those flowers that celebrate this wonderful day in the life of our church. Good and gracious God, we come to you this morning as people of faith and people of doubt, people of trust and people of suspicion, people of success and people of failure, people of love and people of hate, each of us imperfect people seeking to know you and to follow you seeking to hear a story of resurrection. 
Oh God, thank you for meeting us where we are, for patiently loving us even when we don't love you as well as we might, for accepting us compassionately and unconditionally, yet challenging us to grow in you and change in love as you shape us into the likeness of Christ. This morning we continue to rejoice that he is raised and, li and lives even now. May we not soon forget the mystery and majesty of Easter, and may we move from the empty tomb out into the world, guided by the light of your love, to proclaim in word and deed the good news that we have been given. Now hear us, O oh God, as we pray the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In a former work role, I co-taught a therapeutic arts journaling class. One of my favorite topics that we'd cover was beauty seeking. There's a fantastic video we'd share of a woman who moves to a small beach town and decides to start looking for heart-shaped rocks on the shore, truly thinking that she would never find one. let alone a collection of them. The video then goes on to showcase hundreds of beautiful heart-shaped rocks that she found. The idea being that when we start looking for something like joy or love, we can often find it, and it'll add so much light to our otherwise dark world. Moments of gratitude and beauty do abound if we just seek them. It's just that sometimes the wear and tear and the daily grind can cloud our vision, sour our moods, and dampen our spirits, making it hard to find beauty anywhere. Coming to church, however, for me, and maybe for you too, is one of the ways that I try to stay grounded in God's beauty, in God's love. Sometimes the week wears me down so much that I can't seem to find God's love, and sometimes I forget to look for it. But then I come here, and I see someone new at the welcome table when I walk in, and I notice the joy-filled smile on their face when they're leaving. Or I see a familiar face, and I'm reminded of the beauty that there is in community. Our church may not be structurally built in the shape of a heart, but it's overflowing with love. Coming here each Sunday keeps me seeking and finding God's beauty, both within and beyond its walls. And what a gift it is, in turn, to make an offering back to the church so it can continue to be a space of beauty for all who seek God's love. So I encourage you to consider making an offering this morning as the plate is passed, or by using the QR code you can find in your bulletin.
Our text on this Education Sunday is about a man who gets schooled. Job has lost everything. His children, his livelihood, his health, his friends just assume that he must have done something to deserve his fate because that was the prevailing wisdom in the world in those days. Bad things happen to bad people. The entire book of Job disputes that philosophy, challenging and dismantling it over dozens of chapters, culminating in this finale. And while the book offers no answers, it does at least help folks to realize that they'd been asking the wrong question. It shifts, what did I do to deserve this, to the more compassionate, why do bad things happen to good people? Now this text does not solve that riddle as God finally emerges to speak with Job and frankly neither does this sermon. God has no answers, only more questions, but they remind us to approach hard questions with a little bit of humility. A reading from the book of Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you will declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribe bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and hear your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal, and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all of this. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you humble ourselves, and may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I am not a biblical scholar. Most ordained pastors aren't, actually. Comparing a pastor to a scholar is a little bit like juxtaposing a family doctor with the world's premier expert in Rasmussen's encephalitis. We are trained to know a little bit about a lot of things, while scholars know a whole lot about one thing. The very needs of the church require a jack of all trades, folks with some biblical expertise and education who can also run a nonprofit organization, offer pastoral care, develop a staff, read financial reports, track budgets, edit media, raise money, work a vacuum cleaner, imitate Jesus, and on occasion, impersonate Elvis. 
Now, having said all of that, I did receive a pretty solid education in biblical studies at Yale. And one of the more useful exercises in those courses was performing an exegesis, which sounds like some kind of surgery. I suppose it is, in a sense, except that the subject is a biblical text, or a pericope, as they called it at Yale, because they like to use Latin as often as possible. Um, as you can see, my entire diploma is in Latin. Uh, ah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that's my diploma from Yale. <laughs> anyway, just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> Exegesis itself is really just a fancy word for interpretation or asking questions of the text. <clears throat> Who is the author? What is their context? What is their angle? Who is their audience? Are there clues in the original language? What can the leading scholarship tell us? <clears throat> we had to turn in one of these reports every week, five pages of analysis about a given scripture, and I'd like to try a little exercise to show you what I mean. A quick ex exegesis right here, if you'll allow. <clears throat> now, I don't want to use this morning's text. We'll come back to that later. Let's try something a little more fun. Let's try 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. Elisha went up there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go on up, bald head. Go on up, bald head. When he turned around and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. <laughs> Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. <laughs> But seriously, let's have a look at this thing. Huh? Starting with these so-called small boys, how old are they? Well, if you go back to the original Hebrew, the phrase here is katan ne'er, which is perhaps better translated as young men, as opposed to small children. Ah, so we've already discovered a flaw in the translation. <coughs> Bear with me, I'm, uh, I'm getting over something. And what of this insult, bald head? What's that all about? Well, it's worth noting that uh, Elisha is a prophet. It was not uncommon for prophets in his day to wear sackcloth and shave their heads as signs of penitence and holiness. So it's easy to imagine that these young men are mocking him for his vocation, not for his male pattern baldness. <laughs> this could be an attack on his religion more than anything else. <coughs> Moving on. How many of these guys were after Elisha? We're told that these bears mauled 42 of these young men. Not all of them, which presumes that there were probably even more of them that fled into the woods. In other words, this was not a handful of kids, but rather a large and angry mob of men. Furthermore, they tell Elisha to go on up, likely a reference to his mentor, Elijah, who was taken up to heaven. In other words, they're telling him to die. Maybe even to go kill himself. <coughs> now, having performed this brief exegesis, the story looks a little different, right? This is not an instance of an easily offended, thin-skinned, bald man being humiliated by small children and sending bears to attack them. This is the story of a prophet who faced a mob of angry ruffians who despised him for his beliefs. The penalty was clearly justified, according to one evangelical resource I looked into, which takes a similar approach to exegeting this text. To ridicule Elisha was to ridicule the Lord himself. Well, hold on just a second. I mean, yeah, I can agree that these guys weren't five years old, and that they weren't entirely innocent, but I don't think they deserved to get mauled to death by bears, or that God 
would send the bears to do the aforementioned mauling. Exegesis can help us to better understand the text, but the author of this particular commentary isn't trying to understand the text, he's trying to justify the text. Serious biblical scholars don't try to justify or defend the scripture. As my esteemed Hebrew Bible professor at Yale, Dr. John Collins, writes of this text, some of Elisha's miracles are, at best, amoral. These stories are concerned with manifestations of supernatural power and have little concern for moral issues. You see the difference there? Collins asks questions and arrives at a conclusion. The other author arrives with a conclusion, namely that scripture is infallible, and then finds evidence that will back it up. Now, I may not be a Bible scholar, but I was trained by a few, taught to read the scriptures critically at Yale. <laughs> Did I mention I went to Yale? <laughs> Critical thinking, asking questions, exegesis, these are all vital tools for understanding our world, our faith, ourselves, and our relationship with God. Socrates crafted the method, and Jesus perfected it. As a teacher, he seldom gave answers to anything, but he asked 307 questions in the Gospels. And you can thank biblical scholars for that tidbit, because I was not about to count them myself. Jesus knew that questions are important. Questions are how we learn. In the book of Job, we're faced with the most difficult question of all. Namely, why do bad things happen to good people? It's not an academic question, at least not for Job. He's lost everything except for his wife, who kicks Job when he's down, telling him to curse God and die. Job's three friends all show up, attempting to convince him that he probably did something to deserve what happened to him. Now, these guys are real know-it-alls, lecturing him endlessly about how the world works, without ever asking a single question. Least of all, how are you? They probably went to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> then God arrives in a whirlwind, and we think we're finally going to get some answers. But God's only got questions for Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God begins, followed by no less than 76 more Questions. God challenges our intellectual superiority and reminds us how little we truly know. Questions have a way of humbling us, especially when we're willing to question our own convictions. When I was at Yale Divinity School, I'm being serious now, okay? <laughs> they had a saying about theory and praxis. Something about learning in the ivory tower and then bringing that knowledge down to the streets. Now, at the time, that sounded noble because I'd sort of drunk the Ivy League Kool-Aid. Now that I look back, it sounds pretty arrogant. That the university could refer to itself as the ivory tower without irony speaks volumes. And it's this elitist attitude, I fear, that's contributed to a growing distrust of education and scholarly expertise. The arrogance of academia tends to breed a dangerous kind of anti-intellectualism. One of my best friends, a brilliant guy with several degrees, used to teach undergraduate literature courses and left it to become a carpenter. He just got tired of the politics, you know, of higher education. But he has a unique perspective having lived in both worlds for a while. I was lamenting America's political divisions over the phone one day when he challenged me. Hey, look, you can't just write off people you disagree with. They're not stupid. They're not misinformed. You've got to understand, he explained, that a lot of folks, especially blue-collar families, are just tired of being looked down on. And he's got a point. Back in 2016, the Pew Research Center already found a growing ideological and political divide between blue-collar workers and college-educated 
white collar professionals. The former had already grown weary, broadly speaking, of career politicians and academic elites, and were more inclined to trust their social media feed, political outsiders, or their favorite podcaster than actual experts. The pandemic accelerated this trend, creating a vast gulf between folks who tried to follow the counsel of the CDC and people who insisted on doing their own research. And I get it. At least, I, I think I get it. No one wants to be lectured or talked down to by someone with a PhD from Yale about what's best for you and your family, least of all salt of the earth folks in rural communities. But maybe put, people shouldn't be too quick to dismiss scholarly expertise, doctors, engineers, virologists, climate scientists, historians, Bible scholars. These people have dedicated their lives to, to knowing everything there is to know about this, this one thing. Most of them probably know what they're talking about, more or less. I mean, if you have to have brain surgery, you want a trained neurosurgeon, not someone who learned how to do it on YouTube. So while I cannot entirely blame some folks for being leery of academic elitism, I do worry that there is a growing strain of willful ignorance in American culture these days, calls for book bans, climate change denial, rampant conspiracy theories, immediate dismissal of anything that challenges the status quo as being woke. Of course, that word was originally intended to describe a kind of enlightenment, which is what education is supposed to be all about. But instead, it's become a pejorative for anything that challenges norms or promotes critical thinking. If there's a black or gay protagonist in a movie, you've got people complaining, it's woke. Doubly so if it's a Disney movie. You remember how folks got mad when they cast a black woman as the Little Mermaid. This is to say nothing of higher education. Gender studies are woke. Women's studies are woke. Black history is woke. Environmental science is woke. But I have to ask, what's so bad about being woke? Would you rather be asleep? As you may recall, I'm a diehard fan of the Mad Max movies. Those post-apocalyptic adventures in the wasteland filled with vehicular combat and colorful characters I've seen them so many times, you might even call me an expert, a scholar. <laughs> well, there's a new sequel coming out called Furiosa, which focuses on a new heroine played by Charlize Theron instead of the much beloved and titular anti-hero Max. And of course, a lot of people are upset about it. So tired of Hollywood ruining this awesome franchise with its woke agenda, one of these people wrote on Facebook, echoing the sentiments of many others on the thread. Now, if you've never seen these movies, you wouldn't know that they've been playing with gender roles from the beginning. But this guy claims to be a fan, right? So as a fan of this series, as he claims to be, I feel compelled to ask a few questions of my brother in Christ, as one presumably straight man to another. So gird up your loins like a man, as God says to Job, and answer me this, friend. Where were you, sir, when the original film came out in 1979 and featured nearly an entire cast of men in tight leather pants? Surely you recall the police chief in that movie, the guy who walked around the station sweaty and bare-chested while smoking a cigar. Surely you know his name if you're such a fan. That's right. Captain Fifi. <laughs> Were you there when the sequel, The Road Warrior, was released in 1982? Tell me if you have understanding. If this franchise has never been woke, why does one of the most prominent characters wear leather pants with the butt cheeks cut out, <laughs> planting his bare posterior on his motorcycle with his blonde boyfriend on the back of his chopper? And what of the villain, Lord Humongous, played by Swedish Olympic-class bodybuilder Kajel Nilsson, 
all oiled up and wearing little more than a Speedo and a hockey mask. And did you comprehend, friend, that the third film, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, features a soundtrack by Tina Turner, who also plays a strong female lead? Or that the most recent entry, Fury Road, was an allegory for the ways in which societies try to control women's bodies and reproductive rights? I'm sorry, my man. But the Mad Max franchise is a pride parade with muscle cars. <laughs> it has always been woke, long before that was even a thing. So why do you think Charlize Theron makes this new movie any different? Hey man, don't get mad. I'm just asking. Okay, so to be fair, maybe that was all a bit sarcastic. Questions should come from a place of genuine Curiosity, humility, and love, that's how Jesus asked them anyway, because he wasn't trying to just shut people down most of the time. He was trying to invite them into a conversation, a relationship. That's what a good exegesis does. I know some folks today conflate teaching with indoctrination, cast doubt on what's taught at schools and universities, but it was a public school that taught me how to think critically how to ask the right questions, how to perform a thorough exegesis. Not Yale so much, no offense to it, it's a good school. But I think I probably learned more at the less esteemed state college I attended, Southern Connecticut State University. Education is important, but a fancy degree is really just a piece of paper. The real value is in being able to think critically enough to challenge our own sacred cows, to take an honest, hard look at our favorite stories, our political loyalties, our religious beliefs, and even, yes, especially, the Bible. Take these things apart, turn them around, explore them from different angles, ask the hard questions with a little humility. <coughs> That exegesis is what gives our convictions integrity. After God's exegesis of Job, he is humble. And friends, that's why we should always ask questions instead of believing we have all the answers. Amen.
Friends, I may not know much, but I know this. God loves each and every one of us, each and every beloved child of God. And may that love be in you, and may you also be filled with the power, the Holy Spirit, and the peace of Jesus Christ. Thank you. 